Genesis chapter 10. We're going to read portions of chapter 9 and a little bit of chapter 10. If you had a chance to read it, there's a lot of names in there. And a lot of names that, boy, we'd have fun trying to pronounce. Some difficult ones. We had a little fun last night trying to go through them. Some of them were somewhat humorous to us. But in chapter 10, there are a few things that I want us to see. Number one, there are three different individuals that every nationality, every group of people came from. Whether it's Indian, Italian, German, American, Mexican, Guatemalan, Costa Rican, Brazilian, whatever nationality you want to name, every one of them came from three individuals. And if that's strange to believe, all nationalities came from one, which is Noah. Noah had three sons. What were the name of his three sons? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Very good. Let's look at some of their things here in this reading. From verse 5, what did we learn about the descendants of Japheth? What title is introduced in verse 5 that has not been introduced in all of Scripture previous to this? A group of people. A group of people is introduced in verse 5. They're known as Gentiles. See the word Gentiles there in verse 5, chapter 10? Hadn't previously been used in all of Scripture and from here forward, Gentiles will be used as a description of those that are not Jewish. There's a distinction made in verse 5 between those that follow the, the lineage of Shem and those that follow the lineage of Ham and Japheth. You'll see over in verse 21 that Shem was the father of all the children of Eber. Now why would it be important the word Eber? From the word Eber, we get the term Hebrew. And as we learn later on in Genesis, that Abram was a son of or a father of the Hebrews. So we see from Jim, uh, Shem's line, the Jewish race or the Semitic race is began. And from Japheth and Ham, we have the Gentiles. Now, another few things. Who was the oldest, Shem, Ham, or Japheth? You want to take a stab at that? Who do you think? Shem, you think? Look at verse 21. You have a thought? Ham? Let's look at verse 21. Verse 21 doesn't tell us who was maybe the firstborn. It tells us who was not the firstborn. Verse 21 says... And the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. So we see that Japheth was older than Shem. By how far, I do not know. So he was not the oldest. Let's look back at chapter 9. And I want to ask you this question because we did not tackle this last week. In verses 20, let's see, verse 18, all the way through verse 27, we are introduced to a character outside of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What character are we introduced to? Not Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or Noah. It's a new individual mentioned in verse 18 and in verse 22. What's his name? Canaan. Very good, Canaan. Now, who is Canaan? Where does he fall into the mix? Whose son was Canaan? Or whose father was Canaan? Ham. Very good. So we have to ask the question, why was Canaan mentioned in chapter 9? When if you look at chapter 10, verse 7 or verse 6, Canaan is a son of Ham, but not the first mentioned, and possibly not even the firstborn. So why would Canaan be introduced in chapter 9 in relation to Ham? Which also leads us to the question in verse 25, why is Canaan cursed when Ham committed the sin? I'll try to answer that question here for us this morning. When was Genesis chapter 9 and chapter 10 written? And who was it written by? Let me take a stab at that. Jace? Jace? 
Okay. Dr. Gunther, who wrote it and when did he write it? Moses. Very good. Let me take a stab at when Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He was in the wilderness for 40 years wandering, and he went up on the mountain and he began to write Scripture. So I want you to think about this. We're going to use our board here for a little graph. You know the story of the Canaanites briefly. Here's Canaan. This is my rough map. Here's Egypt. And here's Canaan. Excellent. So in the desert for 40 years, I apologize, that's not easy for everybody to see, but they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And they were being promised a land that there was flowing with milk and honey. The name of that land was Canaan, right? So as they're going about and the Israelites are about to invade into the land of Canaan, Jericho, Moses begins to tell them this story from Genesis chapter 9 and helps them put the pieces together here. Why are we going in to destroy these Canaanites? In chapter 9, he shows them here that Canaan from the very beginning was cursed. Cursed by Noah, cursed by God. Flip over to Genesis chapter 15. He also highlighted another area where there was a curse. You're familiar with the story from Genesis chapter 15. Abram. In verse 13 of chapter 15, God says to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them. And they will afflict them 400 years. What's he referring to there? What time frame? Where are the Israelites going to be? Egypt. Bond slaves to Pharaoh. 400 years. Verse 14. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. How did he judge the Egyptians? Ten plagues. Very good. And they will come out afterward with great possessions. Did the Israelites come out of Egypt with great possessions? If you remember the story, they went to their neighbors and asked them for goods, and they provided them goods and left rich out of Egypt. In verse 15, now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. Now where is Abram standing when he says here? In the middle of Canaan. In the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. As you read on in this section, the Amorites is a conglomeration in verse 21. The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgagites, and the Jebusites, all the ites are mentioned there, verse 19 through 21. The Lord's telling Abram that about 600 years from now, your lineage is coming back to where you're standing today. And it says there in verse 16 the iniquity of the Amorites, the Canaanites, is not yet complete. But when they go in to wipe out the Canaanites, it will be complete, their curse. There's a lot of references, and I'll just highlight a few of them, of Canaan previous, previous to their conquest. You're familiar if you want to just flip through these quickly from Genesis chapter 13, verse 12. If you remember that Abram comes to Canaan, he has his nephew Lot with him. And if you remember, they say, you just choose which one you want. You can have over here or over there. And which one does Lot choose, the better or the worse of the two? He chooses physically what he thinks is better, right? And what ends up happening to Sodom and Gomorrah? They are cursed and they are struck. Now, if you remember from our reading in chapter 9, Chapter 10, I'm sorry. Where did Sodom and Gomorrah, what lineage did they come from? Did they come from Shem's? No, they came from Canaan's. Verse 15 starts Canaan. And verse 19 mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. You'll remember in chapter 17 of Genesis, again the Lord promises in verse 8, 
I will give to you and your descendants the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, I will be their God. God promises Abram's descendants the promised land. If you remember from chapter 24, flip to Genesis chapter 24. In verse 3, Abram has a son. What's Abram's son's name? Isaac, very good. Does Abram want Isaac to have a son from the Canaanites? That's a good answer. Whoever said that, no. That's correct. He says in verse 3, uh, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites whom I dwell, because they are wicked. Do not take a son from the Canaanites. Flip over, if you would, to chapter 28. In verse 1, Isaac gets his wife, has a child, and that child's name is what? Jacob. In verse 1, what does Isaac tell Jacob about a wife? In the end of verse 1, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now, look at this in verse 6. Esau saw that Isaac was blessed and that he blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badam Aram to take a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughter of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. And Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So what did he do? He took a wife from the Canaanites. You won't know that from reading just verse 9, but if you flip over to chapter 36, it'll tell us very clearly. Genesis 36, verse 1 and verse 2. Esau saw that his father did not want him to take a son or a wife from Canaan. And just to spite them, in verse 1 and verse 2, Esau's genealogy, verse 2, Esau took his wives from the daughters of who? Of Canaan. Just to refer back to last week, the idea of respecting our fathers. It's essential that as children you honor your father and your mother. Proverbs chapter 1 tells us, I'll read it to you right quickly. Proverbs chapter 1 tells us, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Children, even if your parents seem to be rough, seem to be strict, honor them. Obey them. Esau had a terrible attitude and wanted to do just the opposite of what his parents suggested for him. You'll remember further on in our story that in Genesis chapter 42, Jacob has 12 sons. And there's a famine in the land in Genesis chapter 42. And where does Israel or Jacob send his sons to find food but to Egypt? Canaan has a, a famine, so he sends them to Egypt. And you know the story. Ends up they go to Egypt buying grain and none other than their own brother is there. Eventually... Jacob and his family, all 70 of them, come to Egypt and they live there. And years later, they become slaves to that very land. And in Exodus chapter 6, the Lord comes to Moses and tells him it's time to get out. Exodus chapter 6, verse 5. We'll start in verse 4. God is speaking to Moses. He says, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers, and I've heard their groanings, how the Egyptians have kept them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. The journey must begin. <clears throat> 
I want to ask you a few questions here. When they got on the doorsteps of entering into this promised land, the Canaanites' land, what did God instruct them to do? Do you remember their instruction? In relation to the Canaanites, what were they supposed to do with them? Look over, if you would, at Numbers. I want you to be familiar with this because this has a direct correlation with you and I today. Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33, verse 51. Numbers 33, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 33, verse 51. Right before they're getting ready to go in, here is what the Lord commands them. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land of before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high places. And you shall dispossess the inhabitants of land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. What were they supposed to do when they entered the land? Were they supposed to adopt their practices and do what they did and marry their daughters? And No, but to demolish and get rid of them. Why? Why would God be so concerned that when they go into the land that they don't adopt their practices? It will pull them away from God. You know the story. Look at Judges chapter 1. Did they do as God commanded them? When they entered in the promised land, did all of the tribes get rid of and demolish the things that they were supposed to? They did not. You remember from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll look at Judges 1 here in just a second, but 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you remember the phrase where he says, come out from among them, do not dwell with them, for I am the Lord your God. He gives them the same kind of command to us today in the New Testament that we must come out from among the world. Don't try to adopt the practices of the world. Don't try to bring them close to your life because in so doing, it will draw you away. From your sincere fellowship with Christ. Here's what it says in Judges chapter 1. I'm going to read just pieces and bits from verse 27 to verse 36. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. In verse 29, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Verse 33, nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Verse 34, and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. So what do we see all these groups doing? They were supposed to wipe them out. They chose not to do so. I'm curious, what reason did they have? Was it because they weren't strong enough? The enemy overpowered them and they couldn't do it? No. It says very clearly, if you look there in verse 35, the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres and those places, yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, what did the people do? What did the Israelites do with these foreign people? Instead of getting rid of them, it says they put them under tribute. You see that in verse 28? They put the Canaanites under tribute. See that again in verse 30? They put them under tribute. You see that again in verse 33? They were put under tribute. What does that mean? They were worth something. These people were worth something alive more than they were being dead. They could be servants to the Israelites. They could use them for financial gain. And so they did so. 
we could also fall into that same category that we may see worldly things and think, well, let's not just destroy them. Maybe we could use them. Maybe they could provide us some money or some means of wealth. Look what the Lord says in chapter 2. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Baalcom and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars. But you've not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns and your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. The beautiful thing about Scripture is just as the Israelites succumbed to the love for money, Paul says something very similar in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And he uses almost similar wording to the Lord in Judges chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He uses the phrase in verse 9, a snare. Just what the Lord used in Judges chapter 2. And in verse 10 he says, pierce themselves through, just like it says they shall be a thorn in your side. Is it possible that we even as believers can have a wrong attitude towards money? That we would maybe cheat the system a little bit? Tweak it just a little so we can have some financial favor? May we lie a little bit to people just so they might give us some more money? Might we love money so much that we would allow ourselves to separate from holiness and run after godlessness? I'll tell you today that if you have a wrong attitude towards money, you will pierce yourself through because of your greediness. And if you continue in it, you will be drowned by destruction. What is your attitude towards money? Verse 11 says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. I hope it's very clear to you that when we talk about money in our walk with Christ, we must be pure. We must flee the things of this world because I'll tell you this, you're very aware of how the world handles money. They will lie, cheat, and do whatever they can to make an extra dollar. The problem is, is that same mentality has come into the church. Flee those things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Money will destroy you. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says this. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. I'll say it to you again from Luke chapter 12, verse 15. You and I must take heed and beware of covetousness. For our life does not consist of the things that we have or the things that we possess. Instantly after Jesus says this, he tells them a story about a man who had barns. And he had a harvest that was plentiful. And he says, what will I do? And so he teared down his barns and said, I'll build bigger ones. And I'll eat and drink and be merry. And Jesus says, fool. Your life will be taken from you tonight. 
it is a foolish attitude to think that we can trust in uncertain riches, that we can be covetous and love the things of this world and also love the things of God. He says in Matthew chapter 6, you cannot love God and mammon. What is your view and attitude towards money? Something else I want to show you from the book of Matthew. I've looked at some of the references in the Old Testament to the Canaanites. Did you know that in the whole New Testament, the word Canaan is only used one time and in one story, and oh, what we can learn from it. If you would look at it, Matthew chapter 15, what a story it is. Matthew chapter 15 and how it relates to us. Matthew 15, verse 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Jesus answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Church, I do not know what physical lineage you have come from. But I am certain that all of us have come from the same spiritual lineage of the Gentiles. Cursed by our sin of the lineage of Canaan. We are dogs. And not sheep. But the gracious God made a provision for us. Through his son. And as you and I cry out by faith. Even as this woman did. That even the crumbs from the master's table could be poured out upon us. May the master respond to us. Let it be as you desire. We are unworthy. The beautiful part as a Christian is that we can remember that we have been grafted in. It is for me to know that I, who was an outcast, can now be chosen. That me, who was filthy and unworthy, I can be a part of the royal priesthood. And me who had no clothing that was fit to be on a wedding feast, Jesus says I can be part of the bride of Christ. Does that not give us reason to rejoice? And reason to shout for joy because great is our reward. Because we have cried out just as the woman did. And Jesus has said, let it be as you have requested. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's you and that's me. Let us not forget how filthy we were. And how unworthy we are. To have communion with the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. Do you understand your standing with Christ? I want to show you from Ephesians chapter 2 how clear Paul illustrates your standing with Christ, whether a believer or an unbeliever. 
from Ephesians chapter 2. This is your standing, either as a believer or an unbeliever. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you He made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. For every unbeliever that may sit here this morning, you are dead in your trespasses and sin. You operate according to the lusts of your flesh and the lusts of your mind. It is a dead state. It is a spirit that comes from the prince and power of the air. But for those who are believers, you have been made alive. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, because of His great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made you alive together with Christ. For by grace you've been saved. He raised you up together and made us sit together with Him in the heavenly places, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through Christ Jesus, saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember, Remember, Christian, that you once were Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was where we were as unbelievers. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. For Jesus himself is our peace, who has broken down the middle wall of separation and made both one, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached to you, peace to you, who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Verse 19. You used to be known as strangers and foreigners, but now no longer but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus and Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Do you understand your standing? that we all once were far off, but we've been grafted in. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Turn back to Genesis chapter 10. There are two veins that we can follow from Genesis chapter 10. We can follow the, the vein of Canaan and Japheth. 
path of slavery. Slavery to sin. Or we could follow the path of Shem. You remember from chapter 9 that there was one individual that was cursed. It was the descendants of Canaan. And it says he was a servant of servants. But blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. There is a curse today that every human being falls under. Every living human being is born into a curse. The curse of being a slave to sin. The problem is is that many people in today's society do not recognize the curse. And what's even worse, they don't recognize that there was a Savior that came to redeem them from the curse. John tells us in John chapter 8, verse 36, Therefore, if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. This morning, I want to encourage you with just a few things. Recognize your fragile state. That there is no need for pride. We cannot stand on our own two feet and be successful. We must be humble. And trust only in Jesus Christ. He is the sure foundation. Secondly, recognize that if you are a slave to sin this morning, operating according to your own thoughts and lusts of your mind, that you can be set free. We read last week from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. And it says that we can fall into captivity being taken captive by the Satan in order to do his will. That can be us. If the Lord has convicted you this morning, I encourage you to repent. Turn from your sin that the times of refreshing may come. Let us pray.